I am Dracula. A moment ago, I stumbled upon a most amazing phenomenon. Something so incredible, I mistrust my own judgment. Look. Dracula. The very mention of the name brings to mind things so evil, so fantastic, so degrading. You wonder if it isn't all a dream, a nightmare. Rats. 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 Thousands. Millions of them. But no, this is no dream. This is Dracula. The original terrifying story of a maniac and a man who lived after death, lived on human blood, took the form of a vampire bat, and lured innocent girls to a fate truly worse than death. Dracula? Oh, what, what's he done to you, dearie? Tell me. He came to me. He opened a thing in his arms, and he made me drink. everyone, and welcome to the Time Shifters podcast. This is your host, Christopher, here as always with Tom. Tom, welcome to the beginning of the spooky season. Woohoo! I've been looking forward to this. You don't want to wish the year away. No. However, this is a favorite time of year of mine. Yeah, I, I could deal with eternal fall. <laughs> <laughs> it is my favorite time of year. Maybe not the school part, but... <laughs> But the seasonal yeah, maybe, stuff I can get into. Maybe not all the back to school, but I do enjoy seeing all the decorations showing up in the uh, in the stores. Uh, the even the Halloween candy and stuff starts sort of slowly working its way into the middle aisle. You know, at the local uh, supermarket. Oh, I even got jealous. My my son being on a cross country team now, he had practice this past weekend, and. His coach loves to have us go to the middle of nowhere for them to go run. And since it was a Saturday morning and we had to be there at 8 a.m., um, well, I'll go for a run, too. I'll just stay away from them. And I'm running on these backcountry roads in the middle of nowhere. And I come around this one bend and one of these little farmhouses. They've already got some of their Halloween gear out including the one that makes me most jealous. They had, like, the 12-foot light-up skeleton. Nice. I'm like, yes. oh, I want that so bad. <laughs> I, I want that, and I, I want, I'm want i going to be one of those people that just dresses it for different times of the year. <laughs> yeah, but this thing is as tall as the second story of your house. It's awesome. I know. They're like, yeah, no, I love that so much, and seeing all the other ones and going and hitting all the buttons. <laughs> Well, they most likely, in somewhere in those decorations, have vampires. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about this week on Time Shifters. We're going to jump right into it. What, what is this vampire that you speak of? Nah, we, are, we are so deep into vampires in this episode. A little bit. As we talked about last time, we are talking about the 1931 original Universal Dracula. Uh, also, we're going to speak a little bit uh, about the Spanish language version that was filmed also in 1931. And then we're going to go ahead and talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula, which uh, came out in 1992. And I think that was a good choice. While there's been many other Dracula films, oh, yeah. I rather think that that one pairs well with this original Universal. I think the theme we're kind of going for is like a then and now kind of a feel, and these are the ones that sit on par with each other. Absolutely. So let's start with uh, the English Dracula. Yes. <laughs> From 1931. Played by a Hungarian. <laughs> yeah. The film was produced at Universal Studios and directed by Todd Browning. It premiered on February 14th, 1931. That's right, everyone. Valentine's Day, the perfect <laughs> perfect date movie. Absolutely. 
It is based less on the less on the novel and instead on the popular stage play that had toured Europe beginning in 1924 and was later revised for a Broadway production in 1927. This later production would introduce U.S. audiences to the Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi. Lugosi was not Universal's first, second, or even third choice for the <laughs> no. role of Dracula. No. Uh, Conrad Veidt was their first choice after he after he'd recently appeared in a couple of productions for the studio, but he decided to return to Germany, fearing his English wasn't good enough for sound films. Mm. Lon Chaney was then their go-to, but his untimely death dashed their hopes for that casting. The studio looked for more established film actors, including John Ray, Ian Keith, Paul Lucas, and Chester Morris. It was sheer luck that Lugosi was in L.A. at the time, touring the play. Lugosi lobbied hard for the part, and after offering to take a salary of only $500 a week, the studio finally acquiesced. And if that seems not low keep in mind that some of the other actors were getting as much as 750 a week in this film businessman renfield travels deep into transylvania to finish the sale of the dilapidated carfax abbey to a mysterious count dracula after a harrowing journey by carriage he meets the count and over a quick meal and some wine all the papers are signed with plans made to leave the next day Renfield, having been drugged, passes out and is turned into the Count's slave. The two travel across the sea where a crazed Renfield is discovered amongst the ship's dead crew. Now craving the blood of flies and spiders, he's committed committed to Dr. Seward's sanitarium, which adjoins Carfax Abbey. The Count ingratiates himself into Dr. Seward, his his daughter Mina, and her friend Lucy's life. When Lucy dies from an illness causing a mysterious loss of blood, Seward calls in a colleague from abroad, one Edward Van Helsing, who quickly realizes that the darkness that has fallen over the Seward's home is not natural, but rather the supernatural machinations of the undead, the Nosferatu, a vampire. Yes, we have Bela Lugosi as Count Dracula, Helen Chandler as Mina, David Manners as John Harker, Dwight Fry as Renfield, Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing, who's also uh, recreating his role from the Broadway stage play. We also have Herbert Bunston as Dr. Seward and Francis Dade as Lucy. It has been a little bit since I've watched this film. Uh, I think we sat down as a family to watch it maybe a year or two ago, probably around this time of year, around the Halloween season. Yeah. It is a film that I enjoy watching, despite the fact that I do recognize a few flaws with the film. <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> but uh, when was the last time you've uh, visited this one? This is probably going to stun you, and it kind of stunned me a little. I don't think I've ever seen this all the way through in a single sitting. Oh, really? Interesting. It's one of those, it's so ingrained into the culture. I mean, it, it's it's the one that most all others are then judged by. Uh, so I've seen so many parts of it that I thought I had seen the whole. I had not seen the whole. So this past weekend was, uh, and now my son has gotten to see it as well. So we sat down to the whole thing together. <laughs> Oh, fun. What did he think about it? Because, I mean, we are talking about a film that's, what, 90 years old? Yeah, no, that's what I was uh, I was uh, ingratiating to him. is like, this is a 93-year-old movie. <laughs> like, it's not far off of a century at this point. Can you even conceive of the fact that we are watching this and, and, and we were having conversation? I'm like, this one's got to also be so close to the end of silent film and the it start is. of talking film, and we had conversations around choice of there not being music uh, in, in the in the movie, other than the opening credit sequence, uh, and, and and all that. It was very interesting to to get his perspective, and then on top of it, he very recently read Bram Stoker's Dracula for school. So, nice, nice. So yeah, so he had the story. So he was the first to go. 
Renfield didn't go to the castle like that. <laughs> That's Harker. They're like, yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> well, so he was busy picking it apart with the uh, with the novel as well as uh, what he was seeing on the screen. So that was fun. Yeah, absolutely. I almost kind of want to get him on this show sometimes when you show him things like this, because I, I would love to have and, and share in that conversation with him. Yeah, to get a Gen Z uh, perspective to all of this. Yeah, absolutely. We might have yeah. to try that sometime. The uh, the lack of music was actually, I read that it was a decision by the studio to not have a lot of incidental music and not have a, a score throughout the film because they were afraid that would feel a little too much like a silent film. And they were trying to ah. really, you know, no, this is a talking picture. Uh, so, yeah, there are all those long, t- you know, moments of, of silence throughout this film. It, it always stuns me what how it's amazing Hollywood itself managed to get out of its own way to make anything at all, ever. Because, I mean... To, to have that opinion is to suggest that the audiences that you're showing it to are so stupid <laughs> that, that <laughs> if you were to add music, they wouldn't happen to notice that they're also talking when there's dialogue. <laughs> you're not just reading a, f- a slide. Yeah, they were just afraid that uh, they'd be distracted by the music. Sure. They were way <laughs> wrong, but okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so, too. This film... It shows that it's based off a stage play. No, and and I'm glad you said that, because what's funny is I didn't do that research in advance. I caught on to that before you mentioned it all, but but while I'm watching it completely cold, I'm like, everything about this feels like I'm watching a play on on stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sets, the, the way they're behaving, the way they're projecting... Uh, almost the acting is overacting at all stages. I'm like, it very much feels like you're projecting to the back of a room. (laughs) Amazingly, I don't see that as much in this film as I've seen in other films. I've seen other films of the era that it feels very much like everyone is, is like, as you said, projecting to the back of the room that are, over exaggerating their their hand movements and their facial expressions and everything uh this one i think does a fairly decent job of keeping that in check uh, there, there are some moments where blocking is a little extra over the top in, in some cases but the big one in this since you mentioned gestures is bella and his hand movements his very his they they've become ingrained in the culture of doing anything vampire like is the creepy hand thing but he did it so much through the film to when there's nothing going on even that you're like all right you're definitely a stage guy (laughs) i think it's lugosi that truly puts this film on the map i think it had it been anybody else I'm not sure we'd still be talking about this film the way we do 93 years later. I would grant you that. He definitely has the presence that you're looking for. But honestly, from my watching, um, Dwight Fry um, as Renfield, he was amazing. Like, he had a lot of great presence Oh, no, absolutely. No, Renfield is astounding in this. Uh, Dwight Fry actually found himself annoyed because he felt he was typecast after this film. Because after this, he was often uh, cast as that, you know, the the jittery guy or the the, the creepy assistant or something like that. Uh, We'll see him uh, in a couple weeks when we look at Dracula or uh, Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you'll you'll see exactly what i mean so yeah he in the end sort of resented and probably aided to the to his uh personal and psychological issues that he had uh, Mm -hmm. after this yeah that that that's a shame but again we're talking about the stupidity of hollywood way back in the beginning not that it has grown entirely out of it today either (laughs) (laughs) And I think he is probably the actor that is the one that over emotes. I, 
the most in the film, but it works for the character. Oh yeah, no, when you're supposed to be you've you you were the reasonable guy at the very beginning, dutifully doing your job and all of that, and now you've been rendered uh, a fly eating maniac. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, he played it well. <laughs> oh. I of all the scenes, I think one of my favorites in that film is when they discover him in the hold of the ship and he's staring up the, the gangway and he's got that <laughs> laugh. It's like, ah, oh, why is that not like the scene of this movie? Everyone shows Lugosi in his eyes and everything. I'm like, no, it should be Fry in that laugh. Yeah, no, th th that was the thing that stood out for me in this is, is that I'm like, yes, Bella Lugosi looks the part, feels the part, but it, in all, and, and Dracula is probably the character with the least lines and the least presence in the film. <laughs> and, and rightfully so. The monster is never the, the really, the truly primary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're supposed to be following everyone else. I mean, he is the, 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 the enemy of the piece. You're not supposed to, like, connect or relate <laughs> or you're not supposed to care. <laughs> right. No, you're supposed to be terrified whenever he comes on. So and, and to that, because he did have that kind of creepy feel like uh, as soon as he's on screen, you're kind of like, please go away. <laughs> <laughs> For the right reasons in this case. Yes, Exactly. I, I do think that his, uh, you know, the Hungarian accent and his his chopped English and everything, it, just, it works so well to just put you at sort of uneasy about his character. Uh, and it, it's hard not to... What, I'm certain when they were doing this, there was no forethought with any of that. But because that's the way this got portrayed... Forever did Dracula get intermingled with Bella Lugosi's performance to the point it shows up comedically mm -hmm. throughout time thereafter. I I, I just it, it's still to this day the 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 Hotel Transylvania series with Adam Sandler uh, constantly trying to get uh, regain that ground where I do not go blah 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> like all of that is straight Bella Lugosi, <laughs> and just to see that it's still into the two thousands and beyond, it is still so interlaced. And it's amazing that Lugosi only played Dracula one more time in his career. Are we talking about just before he died? Too? No. Oh. I mean, he he did portray a vampire in other films. Yeah. But he only played Dracula in one more time in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Uh, okay, that's right. I... Yes, what you're saying is absolutely true. So he comes on, he plays this role, and then everyone tries to mimic it from that point forward. Or actually, what's funny, the characters or the actors that played Dracula in subsequent films don't try to mimic Lugosi. They do their own thing. But 93 years later... Oh, I want to. I yeah, going to that's talk. the one that still hangs. That's the one yeah. everybody thinks of. And, yeah, and if you aren't doing it with that deep accent and, and, and that drawl and that that just that that mood about it, everything very slow, very very determined. For a man who's only lived one life, you're very wise, Van Helsing. <laughs> yeah, it's still an absolute blast of a film to watch. They, Universal, uh, I, I think I read, too, that they were really wanting to do a really big production based on the novel. But um, coming out of the, in, in, or in the middle of the Great Depression, they decided to not spend that kind of money. Right, yeah. They still built some incredible, some astounding and some massive sets for this film, which they ended up getting their money out of because they used for like a decade or more afterwards in other films. The the castle sets, mm. for for instance, I, any of these I could actually the 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 uh, Carfax Abbey the uh, the staircase. Yes, isn't that used in like just about every Errol Flynn movie? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's possible. Isn't that the staircase that he's constantly swashbuckling off of? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, no, that staircase has been seen in so many things. So yeah, while we didn't get the, the giant production, uh, we got something a little bit more scaled down, but it was still, I still think it was an impressive uh, production nonetheless. No, it, it was, but because of uh, the the time and the um, retractions that they might have had to have done to to be sensitive to the moment in which they're making this, there are clearly some misses along the way. There are some serious jumps. There's some uh, wild uh, uh, transitions. Like, for instance, like like Renfield. We have that meaningful scene with Renfield as uh, as he's trying to do the work with with Dracula to set him up in his place that he wants to be in London. And you see the meal, you see him drink the wine. Obviously, he's being drugged at this stage as he just basically passes out shortly thereafter. And then we instantly jump to he's a nutbag on, 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 on a boat. <laughs> and like... I need a little something in there. There really should be something more in there to transition that. Uh, so you get a number of those kind of circumstances in this film that uh, you're like, there's more to tell here, but we didn't get it. Well, and with that, let's jump a little bit into the Spanish language uh, version of this film little backstory here. In the late uh, 20s, Hollywood studios depended on the successful exportation of their films to other countries. And while silent films could easily be sold to other countries, sound film could not. So by 1928, the preferred approach to the foreign language market was to develop more than one version of a film using the same script, sets, and costumes of the English language original, but employing different actors who could speak the languages such as French, Spanish, or German. Uh, this Spanish language version of Dracula was filmed at the same time as the English version. The crew would cut the crew and cast would come in like at night or when the one particular set wasn't being used by the English cast and crew and would film their parts. Uh, this film was shown in Cuba in 1931 and then largely forgotten outside of mentions of it having existed by film historians. It wasn't until sometime in the 70s that an incomplete print was found in a New Jersey warehouse. A complete print was later found in Cuba, and it was finally restored and released by Universal in a 1992 VHS edition. In 2012, Universal did a major restoration of this and the English language version for the Blu-ray release. The plot of the Spanish film largely follows that of the English, with only slight deviations, uh, with several scenes of dialogue added. In this film, we have Carlos Villarías as Cunde Dracula, uh, credited as Carlos Villar in the film. Lupita Tuvar is Eva. Barry Norton is Juan Harker. Pablo Alvarez Rubio is Renfield. Eduardo Arosa Mena is Van Helsing, and Jose Soriano Viosca is Dr. Seward. And we also have Carmen Guerrero as Lucia. So, yes, as I said, a completely different cast. This Dracula, I don't think, has Lugosi's gravitas. Unfortunately, no. Um, but. For for some unfortunate reasons. Uh, for me, it was his ears. It, the the slicked back hair on him made his ears stand out more, which after watching Bella Lugosi was a little off-putting. A little, but you know, I think that it kind of fits the idea of the vampire if you go back to like the early like Nosferatu oh, yeah, film no, no, The no, Silent no. Uh, with the more rat like uh, pointy ears mm -hmm. I, I I feel like watching him and you're talking about in the English language about some of the the, the over exaggeration and the gurning of some of the actors and he's the one that if John Aston had played Dracula 
<laughs> if Gomez Adams as Dracula on Halloween, this is what he would look like. <laughs> he kind of, and it's all about the eyes. Because, mm. uh, yeah, his eye, uh, Carlos's eyes are really big. Yes. Uh, and they're almost overpronounced in this. In fact, actually, the thing I noted in this versus the Bella Lugosi one is the telltale uh, pinpoint lighting that they used on Bella mm -hmm. um, didn't use that really on Carlos. But to Carlos's credit, he didn't overplay the creepy hand thing. No, he didn't. He was the very different uh, portrayal of Dracula, which I, 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 I appreciated that he wasn't trying to uh, mimic Lugosi. No, and... and and he didn't, and it was a completely different, and, like, I can take away good and bad from both sides on that, but it was fun to see. And he still had pretty good presence, given that he wasn't the Bella Lugosi version. Mm -hmm. I should mention this film, uh, while the English was directed by Todd Browning, this one was uh, directed by George Melford, who was uh, an English director, uh, he did not speak Spanish. He had a translator on set to help communicate with some of the cast who were uh, strictly Spanish-speaking actors. So I don't know how much of it was the director deciding not to do this kind of stuff and mm -hmm. how he directed the, the actors and how much of the actors put themselves or, or made these choices. Uh, the uh, Spanish-language crew, the film crew, and the director had a chance to see a lot of the dailies that were done through the day on the English language version. Yeah. And I think that gave him sort of an, adv an advantage and a sort of um, a sense of one-upmanship <laughs> yeah. where they saw something and go, hmm, we can do that better. Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways, definitely on the technical side of things, I do think the Spanish film is superior to the English language film, especially in areas of uh, special effects and sound design. Mm -hmm. No, I get, I give you that. Uh, the only places where that, and again with the copies over time and all that, I noticed that the Spanish-speaking one had some more like, um, uh, like background information they used film from other things uh in in some of the sequences when i was watching like uh almost like they had some shots from the ocean cruise that looked like someone tried to actually film on a ship i mean it was really mm. super grainy and well a lot all the um they might have used different uh, shots than they did in the English, but I think they all came from a previously produced silent film that Universal did. Gotcha. Okay. Which, if you, which would, ex which uh, also explains, you probably noticed that uh, in a lot of those shots, the the motion of the sailors and stuff on the ship were exaggerated and very quick. Mm. It's because they, it's the a different frame rate and everything that they to incorporate to the, gotcha. the more modern uh, filming. But it was more pronounced in the uh, in the Spanish speaking version that uh, these were even present, and because uh, that that's the thing, uh, as I believe we noted uh, before ever recording, this the Spanish speaking one's almost a full half hour longer than the uh, than the Bella Lugosi one. Right, and a lot of that is just a few scenes that are elongated. Mm -hmm. And there are some additional scenes that aren't included at all in the English language. I read a couple varying reports about why, but Todd Browning apparently ripped a lot of pages out of the script and <laughs> just decided to, you know, just to, for brevity. Uh, there's lots of uh, different reports as to why. There's some that were saying that, you know, he was a, he was a friend of uh, Lon Chaney and was... You know, still kind of struggling with his death. There was, I think, also possibly... Uh, maybe I shouldn't even say the next part. Never mind. <laughs> but uh, but there are a, a couple different uh, reports and reasons why he just wasn't as meticulous or... He, he seemed to be trying to effectively kind of phone this one in. Gotcha. And I think even that there was some days where he wasn't on set and a 
a, a, a B unit director sort of thing uh, took over and was sort of an almost uncorrect, uncredited co-director of the film. Oh, nice. Okay. So the fact that we got what we got out of uh, somebody that was kind of half-assing his way through it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's kind of a, amazing. We 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 got something that we that we did. So yeah, there is a it, honestly, and there's some scenes in the Spanish language where I feel like. I can kind of see why Browning might have dumped this because it just brings the film to a screeching halt. Yeah. It's not that it's not interesting. There's at least one scene with Van Helsing giving, like, the backstory of Dracula. He goes back to, you know, and, you know, 400 years ago there was this family and they, they were vampire And they're like, interesting, yes. Does it slow this film down a lot <laughs> well yeah and, and, and it's the choice of method of delivering that when it's just a, a, a speech given in a in, in somebody's office it, it comes off super dry <laughs> mm-hmm. there are many scenes that I think are a lot improved in the Spanish the um, the point where Van Helsing confronts the count with the cigarette box with the mirror mm-hmm in the English language, it's like, oh, I wonder if you'd uh, look at this. And yeah, you know, yeah. Lugosi, like, ah, oh, and he just smacks it down with his hand. The Spanish language, he takes his cane, really gives it a whack. There's cigarettes flying everywhere. The box is shattered. I'm like, holy crap. Yeah, no. That, I mean, it's a really violent scene. That, that one came across with a lot more impact than the other one. Right. And then to see him, like, suddenly, oh, <clears throat> and straighten up. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> And it's where I'm trying to divorce myself from the fact that I'm more of a modern film guy. You love to dip back into the really, the original films, the older, Mm -hmm. older films. So I have to at least divorce my feelings from the fact that everything's going to be a little slower, a little more muted. Um, and, And because film is developing off of stage work. It's all very staged. It has that stage feeling about it. So, but stuff like that, those are the moments where you see future film coming. It's a lot more visceral in the moment. Well, I thought they did a nice job in the Spanish language to um, give the whole film a little bit more of a, 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 a fluidity. Uh, mm-hmm. The camera, I think, moves a little bit more. They show off the sets that they built a lot more in the Spanish language versus the English language, uh, especially in Dracula's castle. Uh, when they're having the, the Dracula and Harker are having their discussion in the bedroom. And there's a moment where the camera like pans back. So you get to see the entire thing and this whole set. And so there's a little bit more camera movement mm-hmm. in the Spanish language that I think is, I appreciate a little bit more. I don't feel like the camera is rooted to the ground. Like it, like it is in the English language. That's what I'm talking about. It is it had more of those more modern notes to to uh, how it was made, and, and I'm gonna go back to their Renfield Pablo Alvarez Rubio. Mm-hmm. Aside from the fact, again, uh, probably one of the standout performances from this. Uh, I, I, the Renfield character is already gonna be interesting because he's the greatest guy. He has to put a lot of energy into that to to convey that but that opening sequence where he's visiting even when he's in just the uh, he he's in the carriage on the way and the conversation with the the people in the little village before he goes on to uh, Dracula's castle um, I don't know all of that flowed more natural it seemed like it was a thing that could be really happening whereas the English language one was definitely stage play feeling. Uh, I mean, it was good. This was better. I mentioned the special effects. Uh, Melford hmm. made an actual effort in a couple instances to really give Dracula a very uh, unearthly feel, uh, a ghostly uh, feel. The rising from the coffin, mm-hmm. whereas in the Todd Browning version, you know, you see the lid open and the camera as the camera pans to the to one side, and then it pans back and Lugosi's standing there. Yeah, and it's very weird. 
in the uh, the Milford film, you see the coffin lid open, and then there's a you know the big rising mist of of smoke that comes out, and there's you you can see the edit, but it's it's done pretty well. Yeah. It's very slight, and then Dracula you know stands up out of the fog. That's nice. Yeah, no, nice touch. No, and it goes more to what you talked about. They, it seems like uh, they did. They did. They they reviewed the film that was being made side by side, and they found ways to punch theirs up just a bit. I think they uh, conveyed Dracula walking through the giant spider web uh, a better in the Milford film yeah, the than in the Browning just film. Passes through. <laughs> yeah, it just the. Uh, the quickness of the of the edit and with the way the, the the Dracula is walking up the steps, it it if you blink, you think he literally did just pass through the web. Yeah. It, in the Browning film, it doesn't come across. It's not as smooth. It's like they cut too soon, and suddenly Lugosi's like four steps, up, you know, beyond it. And you're like, well, what happened? I don't get it. And then the and then the uh, Renfield character doesn't really react to the fact doesn't that react enough uh, yeah and then just he breaks the web and goes down but you're still a little unsure about what just happened and in the melford film you will know exactly what just happened is somehow this person somehow went from one side of this giant web to another without disturbing it yeah and, and well yeah no because uh, pablo's renfield uh it, it is visibly like he's thrown off it, there is like mm-hmm. Did I just see that? Did did yeah. that just happen? There was that, and and his hesitation before he takes his cane to part the web. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, yeah, no, he. There was more moment to that, and, and it, it's just what we keep reiterating is this one just kept dialing it up just a little bit more. I, I think this Renfield, the uh, the the Rubio Renfield. Throughout the entire film, whenever he was confronted with something a little supernatural, he reacted more than Dwight Fry's Renfield yeah. did. You know, there's doors opening and closing by themselves, and Fry's Renfield just walks through them like he just went into Costco. <laughs> he, he did, yeah. Now, his crazy was great, but yes, yes. you're right. Uh, his reaction to the things that he should be reacting to were, were off. And I like that they put in some creaks mm-hmm. to the doors in the Spanish language. Uh, the the exterior castle door, all the bedroom doors. There's you know creaking and and old old uh, hinges and everything. Whereas again in the English language, it's all practically silent. Yeah, and, and nothing's more mo- noticeable. And I know we need to be leading our way to the two versions of the ending. A lot of that is very more dynamic in the Spanish speaking film because like just the act of trying to break down the door to get to where Dracula and in this case it's Ava, um, they're they're inside and that was actually an intense sequence as they're ba- beating that door down and in the English speaking one it just kind of happens. Yeah, they just kind of shoulder they themselves shoulder against the door they, a little they, bit they get it open and it's dramatic in that if that's the only one you're watching and then you see this one you're like okay they had to actually put themselves into this one mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it just keeps carrying like that for both endings they're they're kind of the same ending but they're not almost at every step i feel like the spanish language just if it's not a full step it's just a half step beyond what the English language did, you know? Mm-hmm. I just, I truly do think it is the superior film. I, I'm not going to say that I don't still love and enjoy Lugosi and, you know, what Todd Browning did in Dracula, but from a technical side, even from a storytelling side, I do think the Milford Spanish language film is is superior yeah because this is where i'm going to pull up the thing that really kind of I, I enjoyed the bella lugosi dracula but having watched it all the way through i am so put off by the end um 
one, it's kind of dull. And two, there it left you with a moment that I'm like, what did you just do? As Dracula has been defeated off camera to the sound of some pounding and some moaning, um, when Van Helsing in the English language one returns and, and he's with the Har- Harkers, uh, they're not married in this one, but uh, uh, Harker and his fiance Mina, he, they return to them, and he is basically so, telling them, go on ahead. I have to do something. And then the film ends. Right. <laughs> like, what the hell was that? No, I, yeah, it's another thing I appreciate it in the Spanish language is, you know, poor Renfield gets some closure. And uh, yeah. Van Helsing says that he's going to stay behind and and make and keep his promise to Renfield to release him and try to save his soul yeah. more or less. Yeah. But, but, and I guess in the English speaking side, that's what Renfield's supposed to be alluding to. But the way that it's stated on, on the Spanish speaking side is far more satisfying. Mm-hmm. No, very <laughs> Even much. though they're the same, they're the same ending. They're the same ending, but how you change up the dialogue is important (laughs) very much do you want to go ahead did you find any uh do would you you want to do any reviews of the uh, of this film sure absolutely now i didn't get anything for the spanish speaking side sure no i I understood i'm not even sure how i would have found that um i'm sure somebody in our audience could tell me how (laughs) but time is only what it is so uh other than a few snippets like uh from new york times uh, we got um Mordaunt Hall, I'm going to butcher that first name, I'm sure, who just stated something, the best of the many mystery films. They, they, they seem to really appreciate it. Vanity, with no named uh, author, uh, wrote, it is difficult to think of anybody who could quite match the performance in the vampire part of Bella Lugosi, even to the faint flavor of foreign speech that fits so neatly. So they really liked his presence. The Hungarian mm-hmm. side of him definitely helps create the mood for the character. And then uh, from the New Yorker, we have John Mosher. I'm not sure. There is no real illusion in the picture. And this whole vampire business falls pretty flat. They're not, <laughs> they're not particularly appreciative of the film. <laughs> This vampire thing is going to go nowhere. <laughs> yeah, way wrong on that front. But but no, I, I, I get the flatness. As much as this is an impressive technical piece, um, it's got some fun story to it. There's definitely some creepy element. But the Bella Lugosi one, as just a cold watch, is a little dry. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's actually why I, even though I found myself, okay, I've seen 1931 Dracula. I've seen it already and watching the Spanish speaking one. I'm just watching it again. I know what I'm about to see, but then seeing how they dial it up made it so much better. Yeah, it surprises you a little. It does. And then interestingly enough, I dug up a, from my f- favorite, uh, Roger Ebert, in September 19th of 1999, he actually did a review of the 1931 Dracula. I think he had it in, even though uh, the Bram Stoker Dracula is 92, he had this in mind. So uh, the passage I pulled from that is he writes, The scenes in Carfax Abbey are an anticlimax after the expressionist terrors of the scenes set in Transylvania and aboard the ship. They're based on the same Broadway play in which Lugosi first played Dracula and owe more to the tradition of drawing room drama, and it it must be said comedy, than to underlying appeal of vampirism. Yet even here, Browning is able to add unsettling touches, as in the way he suggests Dracula's presence in the visits of bats and in the drifting of fog. So... He very much appreciated the technical aspects. He actually gave this a uh, full four stars. So um, he did like it, but he's pointing out it has its flaws too. 
Yeah, I would love to see if he ever wrote any kind of review for the Spanish language because I, I, I imagine his review, as far as star ratings go, wouldn't change. It would probably be a four star as well. Yeah. But I could see him watching that and then deciding to give the Lugosi one <laughs> three stars. Yeah, three, <laughs> maybe three and a half. <laughs> right. Dial it back a little bit. But the thing I love about reading any reviews, especially anyone that one is, would be more modern reviewing something that old, is they're gonna because it comes first. It's going to get a level of appreciation that might be a little loftier than maybe it fully deserves. But you have to live in the head of that time period. All right. Well, we are definitely running long here in this episode <laughs> so let's take a, a short break here and then when we get back from that we're gonna jump into one of the films that were that was inspired by this 93 year old film and look at bram stoker's dracula from 1992 tingling nerve shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters you won't believe your ears when you listen to monster kid radio hear your host derek m cook and his ever rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classics and sometimes not so classic monster movies subscribe to monster kid radio through itunes or stitcher or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of monster kid radio go through the archives for interviews with sarah karloff victoria price and joel hodson listen to discussions about movies like creature from the black lagoon island of terror and king kong and don't forget convention coverage from monster bash and the hp lovecraft film festival classic monsters modern talk and the head of rondo hatton only on monster kid radio distributed by columbia pictures and directed by francis ford coppola this film is based more heavily on the actual novel utilizing many characters excised in the previous films such as arthur holmwood and quincy morris and follows a sequence of events laid down in that original story the cast in this one is uh, Gary Oldman as Count Dracula slash Vlad the Impaler. Winona Ryder as Mina Harker, uh, also appearing as Elisabetta. Keanu Reeves as Jonathan Harker. Tom Waits as Renfield. Anthony Hopkins as Professor Abraham Van Helsing. Richard E. Grant as Dr. Jack Seward. Sadie Frost as Lucy. Carrie Elways as... Arthur Homewood and Billy Campbell as Quincy Morris. Christian Slater was originally offered the role of Jonathan Harker, hmm. but he declined. Keanu Reeves was cast, and according to Coppola in a New York Times interview with Janet Maslin, we tried to get some kind of matinee idol for the part of Jonathan because it isn't such a great part. If we were all going to go to the airport, Keanu is the one the girls would just besiege. <laughs> He went on to say that Reeves worked hard on his accent, harder than most realize, and felt that he tried maybe too hard, saying that he, quote, he wanted to do it perfectly, and in trying to do it perfectly, it came off as stilted. Mm -hmm. I tried to get him to just relax with it and not do it so fastidiously. So maybe I wasn't as critical of him, but that's because I like him personally so much. In this film... Uh, in 1492, Prince Vlad leaves his bride, Elisabetta, to go on a campaign against the Ottoman Empire. Successful in battle, he returns to discover that his bride received the false news that he'd been killed. She takes her life in the hopes that they will be reunited in death. Having committed suicide, the priest claims that her soul is damned. Denouncing the church and God, Vlad plunges his sword into a crucifix which begins to bleed. He drinks of the blood and swears that he will avenge Elisabeth, Elisabetta with the powers of darkness. 400 years later, after the first solicitor, Renfield, returns from a trip to see the Transylvanian Count Dracula, severely disturbed to the point of needing to be committed to Dr. Seward's sanitarium, 
Jonathan Harker is sent to finish the work of selling several London properties, including the crumbling abbey that adjoins the sanitarium grounds. Meeting Count Dracula and finishing the business at hand, Dracula insists that Harker write letters home stating that he will be staying with the Count for a month. Harker is then drugged and attacked by the Count's unearthly brides. Dracula's Romani helpers help him and so help send him and several boxes of dirt by ship to England. The ship arrives in port with the crew dead, the captain lashed to the wheel. Later, a young revitalized count hypnotizes and attacks Lucy Westerna, a friend of Harker's fiance, Mina. Mina, who Count Dracula believes to be the reincarnation of his dead wife, seduces her while he slowly drains the life from Lucy prompting her friends, Dr. Seward, Arthur Holmwood, and Quincy Morris to summon Dr. Van Helsing. The doctor quickly realizes that this is the work of a vampire. Just as it seems Dracula has won the heart of, won the heart of Mina, she receives word that Jonathan has escaped the castle and is recuperating at a convent. She immediately leaves to be at his side. The crestfallen Dracula finally kills Lucy and turns her into the undead. Once Mina and Jonathan have returned, Harker, Van Helsing, Seward, Holmwood, and Morris set out to find the vampire, not knowing that he is closer than they could imagine. I saw this film once before mm -hmm. in the theater. Yeah? I've not watched it since. This is the first rewatch in, well, since 1992. <laughs> I can honestly say I had this one on VHS. Like, I saw it in the theater, and then I owned it and watched it periodically. But I probably last watched it periodically sometime in the mid-90s and had put it away until we watched it now. <laughs> I saw it in the theater. I didn't like it. I seem to recall that. <laughs> Rewatching it today... But not today, but yes. for this show, my opinion really has not changed. <laughs> I really, I really don't find this to be an interesting film. I find. Oh, here, here's the thing. Uh, my taste in the early '90s, I, I appreciated it for what it was at the time that I, it drew me back to it over and over again. A a admittedly, it probably had more to do with the pretty girls than anything. Um, but yes, upon rewatching, I found it kind of aggravating to watch. It's like, uh, I kept having this opinion that it felt like it wanted to be an art film and still failed to do that as well. I feel like outside of Gary Oldman... And maybe Tom Waits. The entire film to me feels miscast. I really don't buy almost anybody. Every they all feel like caricatures or yeah. something. I I just can't get into the film when I'm watching. Here's how I feel about this film. Having now rewatched it. I really want to go and watch Mel Brooks' Dracula Dead and Loving It. Because <laughs> at least that would be a, a proper parody as opposed to this one, which was not supposed to be. <laughs> yes, it, it feels like a, to me, in, a in some way, it feels like a, a failed parody. Yeah. Um, this one, actually, knowing that the 1931 films literally were made as if they were stage plays... This one felt like it was a big-budget film that still didn't manage to be anything more than a stage play. A lot of the, the acting, uh, like, like, because you're talking about them in caricature, it feels like that. It feels like a person playing a part, not the character to which we're supposed to be seeing. And there are many scenes filmed where you get the impression that someone was trying to pretend that there was this larger world around the scene mm -hmm. when they're, you know, they because of budget or mm -hmm. constraint or studio setting, they couldn't do. 
like the the dinners between uh, the the count and Mina, and they have the little uh, the the translucent window behind him where you see people dancing. Yeah, that just feels like, oh, you didn't have a big budget to do it in a ballroom, right? <laughs> so you're you're pretending. You just have the same three people spinning around in the back. <laughs> Well, and, and because of the way this one is told, and I actually appreciate the fact that despite the fact that in Dracula, the novel, they don't really bring up too much related to Dracula's actual heritage, what they're pulling it from. I actually did kind of appreciate that they tried to actually give some of the historical backstory to which the character is based on just so yeah, yeah. especially since and especially since I had my son watch this with me as well um and he had he's fairly fresh off the novel he's like there really wasn't a love story in that and, and I like this will be the one thing that I'll actually I'll like yes you're absolutely right and not that this love story came off very well in this, but I didn't mind the attempt to do it. I kind of, this, if anything, this is the, the cool part. The movies today with bad guys in them want to give you a reason for why the bad guy's a bad guy. So from his point of view, he's a good guy. In this movie, this is a... a, a at an early attempt at taking the monster and trying to make him a little more relatable, give him a reason for being like he is. Make him sympathetic. Make him a sympathetic character. I mean, after all, by the time we get to the end of the movie, he's been redeemed. He's been saved. He has to die to do it, but he has been saved. And that is not in Dracula. <laughs> but, no. But I don't mind that. But I don't think they pulled it off successfully. Like, I think you could have done this way better with different people and successfully pulled that off and made you like it. But I didn't like it in this. <laughs> yeah, this suffers from trying to fit the mold that had been laid down for the last, you know, 80 some odd years since the first Dracula film. Yeah. Or since uh, the... the the first Dracula film that we talked about right. in that everyone tries to make the vampire uh, a romantic character, mm -hmm. you know, this, this love story and everything. Whereas, you know, in the novel in the original uh, silent Nosferatu, he is, there's nothing romantic about him. He's, no, no. He, he, he's a villain. He's a monster. Yes. And I think this film would have been better had they, really kind of laid into that and decided let's not do every do what everybody else has done right let's let's keep him as the villain as the monster through the entire thing and make this about overcoming you know having these people have to come together and overcome this enormous obstacle in order to save uh, Mina, because there is your love story is the fact that everyone that is trying to help Mina, Seward, Harker, Homewood, Morris, they all are crushing on this woman. Mm -hmm. So get someone besides Winona Ryder, <laughs> because she, she. I like Remember, Winona Ryder. They were She's done crushing on Lucy. Oh, that's right. They, they, because Lucy had her entourage. That, that's the part that, and the fact that you already kind of linked that back to Winona Ryder's Mina. Part of what the Lucy character was the more interesting and her her tale through all that. And, and Mina kind of muddies the water in all of this. And then on top of it, if this is the love interest, it, take, it gets you into it. It takes you out of it. The fact that uh, Mina, when she's finally faced with young version of Dracula, um, she's repulsed by him immediately but in within five minutes she's taken by him and this is a failed moment if that's the that's what you want to do is embrace the power of dracula that he is such a force to be reckoned with that even somebody vehemently opposed to him will crumble under his presence we didn't really get 
that because we did want to take it in the love story. You couldn't decide. Is he using some sort of mind power mm-hmm. to hypnotize her, or is there actually some... I think the film tries to kind of lean into the idea that there's a, a romantic connection, that she truly is the reincarnation yes. of Elisa Bita. Elis- Elisa Bita. Yeah. And... Uh, that never works for me in any film. No, and, and well, and the the way that it just kind of turns and she kind of buys into that with no reason to buy into that is just like I said, this, this is just a film filled with ideas that don't ever fully come to fruition. As much as they they had the technical to make Dracula way more than he has been in past movies. Um, Despite all that, no one seems to be bothered by being in the room with it. And that, and and from the Bela Lugosi days, that that was always, I I get where it came from, but everyone was super comfortable to have just a casual conversation with Dracula, which did throw me a little off. I mean, this is the monster, and you guys are all just cool with hanging with him and having a conversation till you piss him off. Now, in this one, he has the ability to show off everything about him. There is all the creatures he turns into, and he still comes off as weak, like, all the way through. He's the big bat in in the room looking really mean at one point. No one is afraid to be in that room with that giant six and a half foot tall bat that they're not thrown. And that weirds me out. <laughs> Other than perhaps Harker, whose hair turns entirely white in that scene. And, and, and I actually kind of wonder where that came from, because at least we understood he had been drained of blood and drugged for almost a full month. And so when he finally gets back to any kind of civilization, the gray hair is him drawn out and prematurely aged even though on Keanu Reeves that didn't look right it looked fake it looked way fake but yes you're right his hair went white in that moment but we don't know why if other than bad makeup that day because the next scene it's back it's back to just the salt and pepper kind of uh look there was one scene uh, I'm sitting there with my son and I go wait did he get better? Because his hair looked just straight jet black. And then the scene goes by. So, and, and actually I read that in, in when I was doing some review searches. Continuity was a problem in this film. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, you talked about some of the over-exaggerated and, and uh, acting of some of the actors in the 31 films. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I thought Sadie Frost, she could have easily fit in uh, to either one of those films and been absolutely, you, you wouldn't even notice any difference. The funny thing is, um, Sadie Frost's performance of Lucy came off as manic as you might have expected the Renfield character. <laughs> Only she wasn't supposed to be crazy. <laughs> yeah. And in this case, in this movie, the Renfield character is almost wasted. I Yeah, he's a bit subdued, honestly, compared to the, the previous two that we've seen. He's subdued, he's off to the side, he's almost irrelevant. And, and the fact that he's trying to still, they're still trying to have those moments with him and his master and him trying to ingratiate him to, you kind of like, why would Dracula even care? You, you've been in the, locked away and you're of no help to him. So what's that about? And even the, uh, the big, you know, the confrontation between Dracula and Renfield, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't you know, betray you. I'm like, why would Dracula think he did? Because we haven't seen anything in this film that would, in the other films, there are moments where, oh, they, they found me. Who could have told them Renfield, you know? Yeah. There are no moments like that in this film. No, I mean, he didn't need to be in the film almost at all. No, they easily could have could have dropped it. But when Renfield's supposed to be a key character in Dracula and you didn't really have him in there, 
I don't know. There, that, that choice was odd. You wanted him in, but you didn't. Uh, you didn't do anything with him. So it, it was. It just everything about this film. It feels like that somebody had an idea, and then somebody else had an idea, and then somebody else had an idea. And we're gonna go. Well, we're gonna try them all. We don't have to actually fit them together or make them make sense. But we're gonna go ahead. Sure. Why not? And, and maybe this is a disservice to this film, but having watched the other two films where everyone is like related and or engaged and you know we don't have the extra uh the extra characters when you get to this film and no one's related Mm -hmm. seward is just another guy that likes lucy uh we we bring in homewood and morris uh and then you have to shoehorn and like oh well mean is a friend of lucy's and and everything this film yeah, there's a little bit of why are all these people together? <laughs> why do any of them care? <laughs> well, and, and, and that's the good point you know, because you actually made that little uh, switch in your head, thinking that everybody was for Mina, but everybody does go to support Mina in the end against something that they don't know how really to fight or even though they all seem super confident about it. Um, but yeah, what, what is what is Quincy's, what is Arthur's, what is Jack's motivation to go help Mina? Re- Revenge for Lucy is the only thing I can think of. That, but yeah, that's the closest thing. And, and interestingly enough, everything with the Lucy character becoming a vampire and all that was way more interesting than most of the rest of the film. Mm-hmm. Except for that was also where I get into the whole why I think this was, tr- I guess, especially with Francis Ford Coppola. He has a, he has a, he is already coming into this with a lot of history. Um, and, and he has a tendency to make a slightly more artsy film than most. But it felt like this was pushing the boundaries. The costuming in this was just over the top. And when you're making a period piece and you're this far out of whack and you're not like you're not I, I, I don't know. It just didn't fit right. It didn't feel like it. Like you can do those kind of things like one of my favorite films, The Fifth Element. When they took costuming to an ultimate extreme, they did it, but it fit because <laughs> the whole thing was like that. <laughs> not that they did this in this film. But to give a, a sort of an, an analogy of how some of the costuming and things, how it it felt in this film and how kind of over the top or out of place some of it was, or even really just the entire, all, all the sets, even the, the sanitarium, the, the guards that had the giant square cages on their yeah. heads for some reason and all that stuff. This feels as kind of, weird and anachronistic as like um the uh i think it was uh heath ledger in the medieval knights with all the modern music oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um i'm blanking on the name A of the Knight's film now knight's tale thank you i had it on the tip of my tongue right before when i getting ready to talk about it and then i completely forgot about it where you, you're doing jousting and you're to we will rock you yeah <laughs> yeah it's one of those uh you can appreciate that, but God, it's a fine line to do it right. And, yeah. and that's what this was struggling with is, is I think they were throwing everything at the wall and nothing was sticking. I, they were going for, I think, and I, or at least I get the, the feeling that this feels a little bit more like some of the European exploitation films of the 70s. Hmm. Uh, some of the hammer horror films yeah. where you had the beautiful women and they were there strictly to have their tops ripped open yeah sort of thing and we did have those moments in this film yes yeah no absolutely yeah thanks lucy (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, lucy's job was to show a a, a, an occasional boob while she was writhing in bed (laughs) yeah yeah pretty much yeah as i was saying before just the the entire cast i just they didn't work for me and, it, and it, it's the and it's the standouts like Carrie always in particular you know that just even if you had like everyone else cast perfectly you got and then you bring in him like nope I'm out <laughs> there's just, it it 
breaks something. Keanu Reeves, I feel, is the same way. We should definitely got to talk about Keanu Reeves. Yes. He's, you know, he's Jonathan Harker. Right. And yeah, I think he's awful in this. Yes. No, he's very wooden. Um, supposedly, he just finished filming like two or three films, and he he actually, I, I think, in uh, in retrospect, regretted doing this because he just, he felt like he was just burned out. He was trying to give it his all, yeah. But it, but he really didn't feel like he had his all to give. And I, I appreciate that he's honest about that because, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it shows. And, and then I, I I did remember reading something where, like to this day, he's still haunted by his attempt at the English accent for this. It's like the one thing that keeps falling. Yeah, love your career, man, but. Boy, that English accent stunk. Yeah. <laughs> no, it would have been better to just not do it at all. Right. Well, and given the role that Jonathan Harker had in this film, really, you could have gotten anybody because it didn't really matter much. No. Yeah, that's true. It was just to enter. Here, let's intro Dracula and then have somebody to fawn over for Mina. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, weirdly, in the other films, honestly, in almost all the films that we've watched, Harker doesn't need to be in the movie. No, kind of. He adds nothing to the overall tale. And that's because you, they constantly, at least especially in this film, they turn the love story to be between Mina and Dracula. Mm -hmm. They take it away from her and Jonathan, which is kind of the whole point of the damn novel <laughs> is their love for each other that her, her love for Jonathan in the book in the novel is what keeps her from falling over the edge right when she's been infected by Dracula yeah it, it keeps her grounded and then his love for her and his pursuit allows him to participate in the defeat of the monster He's willing to put him up himself against Satan himself, practically, in order to save his love. You don't get that from this film. No, absolutely not. And I remember after seeing the film that that was my biggest gripe is, like, Mina should not be attracted to Dracula. She should be repulsed by him at every step. Yeah. So, yes, that, that really bothered me. That was a de That was a decision made for this film that... I believe was the wrong decision. Uh, which is hysterical given one of the things that happens actually in this film. It was one of the little uh, wonderful little uh, uh, tidbits about the film. The scene in which um, Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder get married was an actual legitimate wedding ceremony performed <laughs> by that particular group of people. So everything they did, theoretically, at least within the confines of that Romanian religion, <laughs> Winona Ryder and Keanu Reeves are married. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Yeah, no, I did see that too. That yeah, in the eyes of God, quote unquote, right. they, they, they may actually be a married couple. Apparently, I read somewhere that Winona occasionally will text Keanu and hey husband <laughs> and start her start her, her chat with him That's... and they both think it's they both think it's funny well, they don't uh... <laughs> Sure but then there's always that little itch Did we actually get married? <laughs> <laughs> no papers were signed no. legally they are not married No 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 but yes uh, if you somewhere in Romania they believe they're they're married yeah, I was really hoping to find a little bit more in this film. Having not seen it in so long, I thought, uh, giving it another try, I'd, I'd glean a little bit more out of it. The practical in-camera effects that Coppola insisted on, I still think, are impressive. They sure. work well. Yeah. Uh, all the, 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 the shadow effects, um, you know, with uh, with uh, Dracula mm -hmm. and, and everything. Um yeah, all impressive. It's in, it's impressive filmmaking. It's just not an impressive film. No. Uh, weirdly, and you know, it gets like a seven point something on IMDb yeah. out of all out of thousands of reviews. I don't see it. No, like yeah, I, 
it being as long as it was, I was kind of thinking, oh, I really loved this movie back in the 90s, uh, and now I'm watching it, and I'm like, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> I want my money back off the VHS tape. <laughs> well, before we get into uh, a few comments and suggestions on that front, yeah. did you find any reviews on this film? Oh, yeah, no, that wasn't a problem at all, and I'm going to start with the, uh, the, the hideous of them all, so... Uh, something out of uh, Seattle Post Intelligencer, quite the name for a, for a rag. Uh, William Arnold writes, Indeed, it is a uniquely dreamlike, lusciously romantic, highly erotic, and prototypically Coppola-esque version of the story. A movie that does for the vampire genre what The Godfather did for the gangsters saga. And what Apocalypse Now did for the war movie raises it to the level of grand opera. I'm like, I don't know what you watched. <laughs> that was not well, that. He wasn't alone at the time. I, I remember lots of people in 92 that just gushed over this film. I know. Uh, yeah, and in hindsight, I don't get it. But going on, we go to the New York Times, Vincent Canby. Dracula has the nervy enthusiasm of the work of a precocious film student who has magically acquired a master's command of his craft. It's surprising, entertaining, and always just a little too much. Hmm. So now we get somebody that's starting to get that there's something off about this film, but they're still kind of way in love with it. Roger. Roger Ebert. <laughs> Again, he likes this a little bit more than, than I would have thought, but I took from his, uh, his review, faced with narrative confusions and dead ends, why does Dracula want to buy those London properties in such specific locations? We didn't even get into that. Um, I enjoyed the movie simply for the way that it looked and felt. Production designers uh, Dante Ferretti and Thomas Sanders have outdone themselves. The cinematographer, Michael Balhaus, gets into the spirit so completely, but always seems to light with shadows. Oldman and Ryder and Hopkins pant with eagerness. The movie is an exercise in feverish excess, and for that, if for little else, I enjoyed it. <laughs> so he kind of liked that it was over the top. Yeah, yeah, he he was in for the ride, but uh, he's not. He he points out the confusion and all that, but lets them go. <laughs> and then Empire, Tom Hibbert. There was so much potential, yet when it came down to it, Coppola made his Dracula too old to be menacing, gave Keanu Reeves a part, and took out all of the action so all we're left with is an overly long bloated adaptation instead of what might have been a gothic masterpiece so a little more with this guy yeah no i think so too i found one from a christian monitor thing that wasn't worth reading because it just took way too much of a religious stance but they hate they hated it outright but for their reasons not <laughs> not actual filmmaking reasons Gotcha. Understood. Yeah, I, and I think it's telling that there may be people listening that feel like we've given this film a bit of a short shrift compared to, you know, as far as like how much we've talked about it versus the first two films. But this is what it boils down to is despite that the first two films are over 90 years old, we enjoyed the hell out of them compared to this film mm -hmm. that's only, what, 30 years old? Right, yeah, no, uh, 92, so yeah. Yeah, no, uh, because the originals are that. They are the originals. You can appreciate them for everything that they are and the amount of effort that went into them, so you can you can enjoy that. This should know better on so many fronts and had money to do it with and still screwed it up. Yeah, you could criticize the first films of sure. being so uh, abridged compared to the novel. Absolutely, but that was going to happen. In this, in this film, I feel they tried to fit as much of the novel in as they could, 
And I think it's a perfect example of why you trim it down. Yes. <laughs> because it works in a novel, maybe. Right. There's a lot of people that I think would read that original novel and feel like, yeah, you could drop a chapter or two. <laughs> Probably. Uh, and so trying to fit all that in, especially trying to fit in all the characters. Mm-hmm. Holmwood, you didn't need. Quincy, you needed him because you wanted that big action scene at the end, which is in, in the novel. Yeah. You know, the chase to, to beat the sunlight and, and, and the final confrontation with Dracula at his castle. It's in the novel and all of them and Quincy is killed and that all happens. Yeah. But you could have found a way to trim this down, drop a character or two. Well, yeah, you've you've already decided you're going to alter the nature of the story by making uh, Dracula attracted to Mina, not not for the purposes of making a new vampire to be his companion, but because he's deeply in love with her because he's she's his reincarnated wife. Yeah, you already changed that. You can make other changes for content. Yes, absolutely. No, the the moment that I def that this film definitely loses me is the moment when you know Dracula it is offering to turn her, and he's like, "No, no, I can't. I love you too much." And she's like, "No, I want this." I'm like, "Nope, I'm out." Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention the delivery of all of that. None of it did you buy. <laughs> no, no. I was really hoping to get a lot of comments and some feedback on these films on social media and got really very little. Uh, so you guys, you, you disappoint me on this. <laughs> We're going to try again here in a couple weeks. <laughs> Thank God my uh, ex-father-in-law ch- decided to chime in and call us childish. <laughs> <laughs> We uh we did get a comment here from uh from from Justin over on Facebook. He starts out by saying the Spanish version is greater than the English version, which is greater than Bram Stoker's Dracula. Fair. And then he follows. They're all overrated, though. Fair. <laughs> I but that did prompt me to ask, what is your definitive vampire film? And. He does. He says that you have got me in a rabbit hole. He says, uh, "Let the right one in" is a pr- is pretty moody. I like that. From dusk till dawn is badass joyride, mm-hmm. but by no means is it definitive. Uh, which I gave him a good. Uh, Let the right one in. The original "Let the white right one in" it was a great shout. That's a really interesting and, and great film. I'd also recommend uh, one that he didn't mention was a, a girl walks home al- a- alone at night. Yeah, is really good vampire film. But anyway, Justin does give me a whole list of other vampire films that he kind of I think he prefers over any of these three. Yeah. Um, he says I used to love Dracula two thousand. Uh, still fond of the original the origin story in that one, but it didn't age well, so it's kind of awful. Yeah. And then he actually goes with uh, Fright Night. I like part two as well. The remake is gutter trash, though, and not in a good way. <laughs> so he actually, so he finally decides, I think he finally settles on Fright Night as his definitive, like, you know, like go-to vampire film. You know, weirdly, Justin, I like the remake over the original when it comes to Fright Night. Interesting. Uh, I'd have to re- I know I haven't seen the newer one, but I'd have to revisit the original his comments kind of got, as Facebook does, the comments sometimes get out of order. He also mentions uh, Dracula from 1979 and Dracula Untold. Um, oh, here it is. My definitive vampire flick would have to either be Lost Boys, I know it's overplayed, mm. or Near Dark. So there you go. Those are his two definitives. Sorry sorry for misquoting you there, Justin, but as I said, the, the uh, comments get a little reshuffled on Facebook sometimes. But all good shouts. Vampires in films don't do it for me as much as if you do it in long form, like a series. My favorite vampire portrayal of any kind, or vampires in this case, is honestly from True Blood. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, if you haven't had the pleasure, I, I, I'd recommend it as a series, but for introducing paranormal stuff and then the notion of... Uh, I really did kind of dig the notion that um, in this storyline, vampires come out as an actual thing. They're, they 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 come forward into there and true blood the beverage is the way that they can live among normal human beings on a regular basis without being a danger to them only it it, it gets into the whole sub story of but they don't like it (laughs) they prefer the real thing (laughs) so then the story builds from there so it's just it, one. It's good and fun storytelling, but that is some good vampire stuff. I like a lot of of, of uh, vampire in film, mm-hmm. uh, but I find I enjoy vampire in novel more. I can see that. It needs the theater of the mind to really make it work. My favorite vampire novel that I've read is Ken Newman's Anno Dracula. Yes, I know that's one of your favorites. Yeah, and which is a sort of an alternate reality. It's if it, it's sort of a uh, a sequel to Dracula had Harker and Seward and the gang failed. Yeah. And the idea of what happens next and I think it's brilliant. It's a fantastic novel. I love that book. That's cool. Yeah. And it very much like in True Blood, you know, it's uh, the vampires find themselves in a world that they can be out and about. Yeah. They, everyone knows the vampires exist, and it all become almost becomes trendy to, to be a vampire. And a few of them are like, like the punk vampires wear crucifixes for earrings and things <laughs> like that. Uh, I loved it. It was just it was such an imaginative and creative world that was built in that book. And so that is an absolute favorite of mine. That's very cool. And one in desperate need of a reread. I haven't uh, opened that book in a long time. <laughs> well, I guess I know what's it, hitting the nightstand. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get the, the other two books I'm currently uh, <laughs> trying to get through. There you go. All right. Well, that is all we got from social media. And uh, so hopefully... but. I got to think there's some other people with some opinions, especially after listening to us go on for quite some time about these three films. Yes. I think we spent a little more time on the first two films than I was expecting. Uh, so my apologies for the length of this episode. <laughs> yeah, but it was a fun. It was a good conversation, and, and that was my first introduction to both. So you were going to get a lot of wordiness from me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I knew we'd have a lot to talk about. Yes. And I think we'll have plenty to talk about next time, but maybe we'll be able to keep it back down closer to an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully so. Our next episode, we're going to look at, from the same year, 1931, we're going to look at Frankenstein, the first Frankenstein film. um, The first talking Frankenstein film, I should say. And then we're going to pair that with 2023's Poor Things. Really looking forward to watching this. Yeah, that'll be a first watch for both of us. Yes, and I'm, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, to discussing both of those films. That and the, the Frankenstein monster is, I don't know, that's just the one that's near and dear to my heart. Interesting. So that's kind of, yeah, that, that's that that's like, that's the one, huh? That, that's the one. Frankenstein's always been my monster of choice. Oh, okay, interesting. Because, yeah, I've always been, uh, I've been the vampire guy. I've always liked the vampires. Yeah, for God's sake, you practically dress like a vampire on a regular basis anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> Back in my younger days. You know, and you really pushed it in the younger days, especially. I was a fan of long black coats, yes, I, you were. I will admit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. So, uh, and then guaranteed on Halloween, you were gonna probably be a Dracula or just a vampire. But yes, uh, but no. For for me, uh, I don't know why I have always been very much. May, maybe it's the fact that it's literally like the really the first real science fiction novel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, we'll definitely have to talk about that at the the start of the show next time. Indeed, in fact, actually, it's inspired me. That that book is hitting. Mary Shelley's is hitting my nightstand probably tonight. <laughs> Excellent. 
All right, well, if anybody has any thoughts on the uh, Dracula, uh, any of the films that we've discussed here today, or Frankenstein or Poor Things, send us an email, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to find all our social media locations and leave some comments there. Look forward to hearing from you. And we'd really like to hear from you. I think this is a fantastic series with the uh, opportunity for lots of feedback and comments and thoughts. So that's going to do it. Tom, thanks very much. Uh, this has been a late one. It's time to like end this and go to bed. It kind of is, yeah. <laughs> but still, love it, love it. All right. We'll talk to everybody soon. Enjoy watching all your spooky movies. Bye, everybody. See you.